Joshua gathered all the tribes together at Shechem, the place he chose for this ultimate stewardship commitment ceremony was absolutely no accident. God first spoke to Abraham at Shechem, promising to make Abraham's descendants a great, great people, giving them a land to call their own. Jacob buried the idols of his tribe right in this very spot, promising to serve the Lord and no other. Jacob's son, the prince of Egypt, was buried there. His bones transferred from Egypt to Shechem and laid to rest in a place purchased by Jacob as his family burial plot. Shechem had deep, deep meaning for the Israelite family. It's not surprising that they would return to this place to make new and significant promises to bury the past even as they reclaimed its power. History gives a place its meaning. It's why for some of you this worship space this morning doesn't feel quite right. This is not the historic place where sermons are normally spoken, children are baptized, the dead are buried. This is not the space where the glorious windows speak to the otherness, the holiness of God. This is not the place where the heavenly organ breathes its magic and the choir is elevated to its angelic heights. And those uncomfortable pews keep you from falling asleep during the sermon. I've got my eye on every one of you. Yet for others of you, worshiping in this space feels absolutely right. Harkening back to earlier times when a church of fewer members chose to worship here, to feel the bonds of community, to get closer to each other, see each other's faces, strip the worship down to its relational roots. Joshua knew that the geography of location connects us to deep history evokes deep feelings connected to that history, and yet he also knew we can't live in the past. Most of us here recognize that. A lot of us here, I think, are openly hostile toward any notion of living in the past. The politics encouraging a return to some mythic, idyllic time in our nation's history raises an immediate oppositional stance in many of you. Yet sometimes I think that today's partisan embrace of returning to the past obscures a reality that I also see. That when it comes to church, a lot of us have very good memories that we often want to return to. We want a church that is as vibrant as some of the ones that many of us remember from our childhoods. We want our children to have a similar experience of church as that central, safe place where we first learn that we are loved by adults other than our parents. We want church to be a community that is different from all the other ones that we have to navigate today, different from the bottom line focused workplace, different from the contentious politics of our present, different from the made-to-order marketplace, a community that is marked by kindness and care and generosity, welcome and love. Some of us want the experience of a choir that we had as children in choir. Others of us want the emotional experience of feeling close to God without all the other creepy stuff. Some of us want the biblical adventure that we received as part of our training, while others of us are hoping to leave biblical trauma behind. We bring all of these memories, tangled up in hope, here to this historic place, yearning to recreate the good parts of our past. We want the best parts of what shaped us now to shape others. We want the best parts parts of what has moved us to move us again. We want to recreate something for ourselves that we experienced or heard from others or read about ourselves. We want that in our community today. The tribes of Israel gathered at Shechem 
must not have been all that different in their own diverse desires. Twelve different tribes gathered for this stewardship commitment represented all different kinds of interests and hopes for this ministry or that mission, for this future or a different one. And Joshua attempts to tie it all together, all of their diversity, with one common hope. One common hope. The hope for a home. A home where their children are safe. A home where there is enough to eat. A home where they can rest. A home where they can be together. And I know these homegoing texts are extremely complicated ones. The whole book of Joshua seems to sanction God-sponsored violence against peoples who already occupy the promised land. The potent mix of religion and land entitlement is, of course, a central feature of the deep division between Jews and Arabs in the Holy Land. And these texts have authorized all kinds of of violence well beyond Israel and Palestine. As Walter Brueggemann writes, European colonial policy toward indigenous populations has received warrant from this book, the book of Joshua, that if not toxic in intent, has in any case functioned in toxic ways in recent history. The God described in the book of Joshua demanding that enemies be utterly destroyed, approving genocide, legitimizing violence against the defenseless, is not the God I recognize or worship. But the longing for a home, that desire for a place where you can let your hair down, not have to look over your shoulder at every turn, Share your hurts, your hopes, your longings. Be inspired to do better, to be better, to recenter yourself in a purpose that is larger than yourself, all the while experiencing and extending grace. Well, that is a hope for a home for most everyone I know. Joshua says to the people and to us, if you want that kind of home, you have to put away your idols and serve the Lord. Stop your idolatry and serve the only God, the one true God. Put away your idols and serve the Lord. Now, surprisingly, our church's stewardship Commit, uh, committee did not choose this as our theme for the year. <laughs> Put away your idols and serve the Lord. But if we're honest, it is the choice that God's people have always had to make. Do you choose the God of Israel who says you are made in God's image? Or do you choose the gods of empire who say you are valued according to what you own or produce? Do you choose the God who commands obedience to the laws of Torah, the foundation of community? Or do you choose the gods of survival of the fittest, the gods of every person for themselves? Do you choose the God who claims that love overcomes all? Or do you choose the gods that say security is the only hedge against fear? We have always had to choose which God we are going to serve. And maybe one of the blessings of having a violence-infused book in our Bible is that we are not allowed to forget that these promises that we make at Shechem, wrapped up with very strong feelings from the past, those promises have extraordinary power. The allegiance we ascribe to God in our time still carries with it power that can build up or destroy. Whatever choice you end up making, whatever God you end up placing at the center of your life, however you choose to steward the life that has been gifted to you, that choice carries power to harm or to heal, 
to help or to hurt, to build up or to tear down. The history that you choose to recreate, the things that you try to bring from the past into the present, those powerful things carry that power to harm or to heal, to help or to hurt, to build up or tear down. In fact, that is the choice that Joshua invites the people to make at Shechem. We get to decide together to serve the God who promises to make a home for each of us in community together. We get to decide together to do the things we need to do to build that home. We get to choose together to put the God of loaves and fishes, of justice, love, and kindness at the center of our lives together. And I know that's hard for many of us today when so many of us are still renegotiating the central habits of our lives post-pandemic. We're not all certain we want to keep working like we've been working. We're not all certain we want to keep running the pace of the rat race that some of us have been running in the past. A lot of us aren't certain the American dream we used to know makes sense anymore. We're not certain that the church delivers enough of a benefit sometimes to justify the cost. We're not certain. But you know, I'm not sure that all of those followers of Joshua were 100% certain either. If they were, I don't think Joshua would have felt the need to press them so hard to make the choice. And maybe that's what renewing a covenant is all about. Maybe it's not about being 100% certain before you make a decision to believe in God or go to church a little more often or make a pledge or sign up to serve. It's about making the decision while you are still uncertain, trusting that God <laughs> seems to help willing, uncertain people find their footing. It's about trusting your gut that there's more to life than the nine to five or a good night of Netflix or a good wage and benefits enough to want to go deeper into the spiritual life with other people who have discovered the same. It's about taking a risk to share yourself at a time when sharing itself seems to be on the decline. Renewing the covenant is owning the risk of involving yourself with God at a time when God involvements are not trending. Retrieving from the past the structure of promise that our ancestors made and re-articulating that promise now for our present and our future. No one can do that for you or for me. A covenant is by definition something that you decide to take on with God. It's an agreement that you decide to own. Yet the beautiful part about church is that covenant is never something that you take on alone. There are other people here who are just as skeptical as you are. There are other people here who are, are just as alienated from our culture as you are. There are other people here who feel just as out of place in the world as you. There are other people here who long for community just as deeply as you. Other people who want children to have the same experience of church as that central safe place where we first learn we are loved by adults other than our parents, other people who want church to be a community that is different from all the other ones we have to navigate today. Other people who long for a community marked by kindness and care and generosity and welcome and love. The hard part of church is also the thing that makes it beautiful. We create it together. We choose to commit to God's vision of the beloved community. We choose 
to commit to God's vision of peace. We choose to commit to a community where the norm is loving your neighbor as yourself. We choose to make that commitment. We choose to serve the Lord together. 